Hey, I'm going to tell you a few things about grades and grading that I think are important for you to know. We talked a little bit about grades at the very beginning of the year, and we're going to bring that full circle and try to think about grades in a very broad way and some uh, consider some pointers about how to use them. So we have three main questions that we're going to be talking about. One, how do grades function? And two, what do they mean? Now those two questions kind of get answered at the same time because how they function determines the meaning that we take from them. But the final question is really how do we best use them? And in trying to come up with a plan for how we do that, we need to consider all the different ways that they function. So when we think about how they function, right, um, one, they give us feedback, let us know how we're doing. Two, they serve as a great motivator, right? Usually, especially when time is a precious commodity, you will do the things that matter the most for your grade and let the things go, right? Uh, three, it shapes our identity. When we do well and we get good grades in some areas, that tends to be an area that we focus on. Very seldom that somebody decides that they want to focus on something that they are consistently failing at. Uh, four, gatekeeping. They open and close doors. You have to have a certain ACT or GPA to get into some places or some programs, right? Your content GPA needs to be over 3.0 by the time you're going to student teach. And so you need to make sure that you keep that up there. And finally, reporting. And this is something you'll be involved in a lot, right? Letting other teachers, letting the parents, letting the students know, letting the public know what's going on in the school. There are student grades, there are teacher grades, there are school and district grades, right? And it's a way that we convey how things are going and people make their decisions, important decisions, based off of those things. So we have these five different ways that we're going to consider. We're going to spend a lot of time on feedback and motivation. We'll talk about the other ones briefly in a little more detail. When we think of feedback, right, we've talked about some of these things, right? What does a grade mean to you? Uh, for a lot of us, it's something about our self-worth, right? Uh, success, you feel bad when you get a bad grade, you feel good when you get a good grade, usually. If you work hard, right, and you get a good grade, that feels pretty good. If you didn't do any work and you just kind of mailed it in and you still get an A, you feel good, but not as good right? Uh, if you get a B, which might be a decent grade, and somebody else that you think you did better than gets an A, it might make you upset. And so there's a lot of different layers. We talked about how many students should get an A in your class, um, and how many people should get Bs, Cs, Ds, and Fs, right? And we talked about the difference between the 4, 3, 2, 1, and the A, B, C, D, F system, and that they're really not that different. And this whole idea came down to you have a ton of control. You will determine how many students succeed in your class, even if we're in something as straightforward as mathematics, where the standard is students will be able to, you know, add multi-digit uh, application or addition problems. And even there, you have control over what those look like, whether or not they include word problems, whether or not they include stacks of just two or three or four different numbers, how many digits those numbers contain, um, how fast they have to do it, how many they need to get correct, right? If the standard is students will be able, right, to add, uh, say, single-digit numbers, well, what does that even mean? Does that mean they have to add them all correct all the time? Or does that mean they just have to get one right at some time and they can get the rest wrong, right? You did it successfully once, so therefore you've met the standard. The truth is there's a lot of gray area that even something as straightforward as that uh, can present to different teachers. And you have to make a decision. And where you set that bar, how fast you go, how deep you go, how you integrate it with other things is going to determine how many students fall into each category. Um, and I want you to be aware that you do have that power. When we think about the different how-tos, and I will have a sample sheet that I will post about this. Um, when we're thinking about giving feedback to students, one, make sure that you align it with your objectives. So for every objective you have in a lesson, if you give an assignment that's aligned with those things, you give feedback for each objective. Two, focus on the efforts and strategies and try to cultivate a growth mindset that values challenge. 
Now the thing here is that you want to not just say good job or good boy, good girl, and try to make it as though it's some kind of characteristic that they have that they don't have much control over. Even things like saying you're very smart, right, doesn't give power to that student. If, however, I praise their effort and their strategies, I like how hard you're working. I like the way that you, you know, uh, use transitional words in this paragraph. I like how you cited uh, resources to back up your arguments. And I like the formatting you used, or I like how you did, right? When you focus on the strategies that make them successful and the effort that they put in, now you've shifted the focus to things that they can actually control, right? You can control how hard you work. You can control the strategies you use. If you focus on other things like just their intelligence or whether they're good or bad, those are things that we feel we don't have that much control over, even though we do, but we don't feel like we do. Those are kind of unchanging or static traits. You want to focus your feedback on the things they can change and the things they do have control over. Third thing, focus on strengths and weaknesses. So even if they did well, give feedback and move them forward. If they did poorly, make sure that you give them a way to move forward and you compliment them on the things that they did well on. Number four, give the students the opportunity to use that feedback. And so one of the things that you will be expected to do is to make sure that you build in some way that students can actually apply the feedback that you're giving them, creating some incentive, some space, some opportunity to do this. Now this can look like extra credit, it can look like follow-up assignments, it can look like multiple drafts, or anything where you are creating a space and a reason for them to use that feedback. Finally, convey the feedback as information rather than a judgment. It's really easy for us to internalize feedback we get as something personal, uh, whether it's good or bad. It's easier if we understand it as information about whether or not we met a standard. And then we tell a story about why we did or did not based on things we can and can't control. And again, we think back about what you're going to be focusing on. You're going to be focusing on the things they can control. And you're giving them information about, well, this is where you are now. You can be in a different spot if you want. This is how you get there, right? And you align it to your feedback. You focus on the good and the bad, or I should say the areas of, of growth in different ways they can grow, then you provide an opportunity and an incentive for them to use that feedback. So when we think about feedback, we're going to be going through a sample grading sheet, and I will have some examples about what that looks like. For those of you in 418, you've already done this, and it'll be more of the same. Second way that grades function, motivation, right? When you have to do something for a grade, you are probably more likely to do it than if there was not a grade attached. Now, if it's an interesting task, that might change. But let's say that like most homework that students perceive as, it might have some value, but it's a lot of busy work, and I hope it doesn't take me too long to do. Even though I might learn something, I'd rather do something else or work on other things, right? Um, if it's tied to the grade, you're more likely to do it. If I said, hey, look over the, you know, the materials I post them each week, everyone gets an A in the class, I have a feeling people would study a lot less. And uh, that'd be true about 95 to 99% of you. I know it would be true for me, right? Because I have other things I have to take care of and time is, is precious. So when we think about motivation in a broad sense, there can be a couple different ways that it works. One, I want to say that one, it usually increases motivation or usually in using grades as a motivator increases student attention towards whatever project, whatever task you're giving them. Now, <clears throat> if they see that the grade as a motivator is giving them information, it will typically have a positive effect. However, if they have a perception that even if it's positive feedback that it's used to control them 
that will have a negative side effect and they'll be less likely to put forward more effort. And so when I get good feedback, right, my intrinsic motivation goes up, but only if I see it as information about my skill. If I get negative feedback, I actually have lower intrinsic motivation. I enjoy it actually less, even if it's presented as information because it just feels bad to get negative feedback, right? So that's one way how feedback uh, and motivation work. The second is that when you use grades as a motivator or as like a, a carrot or a reward, how effective it is is going to depend on where your student currently is at in terms of how they're regulating their behavior. Now, there are six different types of regulation that we're going to talk about. One is a motivation, meaning that you don't want to do it. You're not going to do it. You can't make them do it. They just don't do it, right? My wife offered her students money once, $5 if they completed their homework over the, a two-week period of time. No, oh, but they had to complete it all. She didn't have to pay anybody a cent. And $5 to fifth graders is a lot of money. They just couldn't do it, right? And nobody did it, which is unbelievable. I was worried how much it was going to cost us, but it didn't cost us a thing. Um, extrinsic motivators, right? So the money is an external motivator. It's, it has nothing to do with doing the homework. It's totally separate, but I'll do it for the money, right? A motivation means you just can't make me do it. doesn't matter what you offer me or what punishment you threaten me with ain't going to do it. Extrinsic means that I will do it for some other reason, whether it's to get a reward or to avoid a punishment. Introjected means that I'm not getting a real punishment or reward in like the money or I'm grounded sense or hit, right? But I am doing it for internal punishments and rewards. In other words, when you think of any feelings of obligation, like you do something, not because you want to do it, but because you'd feel guilty if you didn't, that's interjected regulation. If your mom tells you how long she was in labor to get you do things and how she reminds you how she fed you souped and carried you home and up to the bed every night, right? Um, that's interjected regulation. Now, in some cases, feelings of obligation or duty make us feel good. Right? I do it because I want to do it. I have a responsibility to do it. It's not that I enjoy cleaning up my, you know, the cat litter out of my cat's litter box, but I feel good about doing it actually. But I'm not doing it because it's fun. I'm doing it because I'd feel bad if I didn't, and I feel good that they have somewhere clean to go to the bathroom. The next step is identifying. And that means that I am doing it for things that I think are personally important. So recycling is one example. When my wife and I are on walks, she will pick up junk, dirty, recycled materials that are laying in the street and carry them either all the way home or to the nearest recycling bin. And who knows where those things have been or what germs they've been exposed to, right? Doesn't want to do it. It's not fun to carry something gross and disgusting that's been sitting in the street, but it's personally important. So she does it for that reason. Integrated regulation means that I am doing it because it's part of who I am as a person. I, you know, you as a teacher will lesson plan and so on because that's what teachers do. You'll stay late, you'll join organizations, you'll coach soccer or track or volleyball or whatever because it's part of it's fun sometimes, not all of it, uh, but it's who you are, right? Athletes work out not because work, working out is oftentimes very painful, right? Um, but you do it because that's just what athletes do. Parents step with their kids when they're sick, even though they're exhausted, right? Because that's what good parents do. So it, it's part of who you are. It's very internalized. And finally, intrinsic motivation or regulation means that I do it because it's just enjoyable to do. Playing video games, um, spending time outdoors, hanging out with your friends, dancing, listening to music, all things that are intrinsically regulated. And so we have this graph to represent these different things. Now, a lot of students are down here and when it comes to homework and things like that, right? I'm not going to do it or I'll do it for a grade, but if you take away the grade, I'm not going to do it anymore. Some people do their homework because they feel guilty if they don't. They have a sense of obligation or their parents or teachers guilt them into doing it. 
Some people do it because they think it's personally important to get good grades in study. I have a feeling this is where a lot of you are right now, a lot of the time, but sometimes you are here, right? Um, some people are here because, you know, I study my science homework because I'm a scientist, or I, I do my teaching lesson plan homework because I want to be a great teacher, right? It's who I am. It's what teachers do. Intrinsic is just, again, because it's fun. Now, students are all over the place, right? Most students in grade school, middle school are down over here, right? And if you thought about the number of students who are up here, it would probably be pretty small, right? I don't know many kids who just love doing their homework all the time and studying and things like that. In kindergarten, it starts out like this, where you try to make it that way. But as you get into the higher grades, there's a migration towards the left, your job as a teacher is to get kids over to the right. And so next week when we talk about one of your assignments, I want you to think about how you can use grades and how you need to pitch homework and the grades that you get back, how you need to communicate them for the students to use this to your benefit if you want kids to be moving over to the right.